In the last couple of videos, I've been doing some experiments using 3D printed flexible TPU gaskets in a hot environment like an engine. In the first video, I installed a gasket on the carburetor of this mower, and I've been using it now for over a month, and it's performed fine. And in the second video, I just took a look at what kind of the baseline of the temperature we were talking about is for this stuff. When does it start to get unusable? But this time, I want to go a little bit further. I want to do a little bit better experiments. And so, I got a lot of feedback from comments and a lot of ideas, and I think I came up with a couple ways we can take a look at this, including trying to heat treat it. And I've read you can heat treat this stuff to get it to perform better at higher temperatures, at slightly higher temperatures. And I also did some torque tests to see how it holds up under stress at temperature. But to do all that, I kind of needed some way to measure it, to get a reference of what the plastic was doing it as it changed temperature. So. I got a tool for that. Oh, and by the way, if you haven't seen those other videos, I'll put a link in the description. This one kind of stands on its own, but if you want a little background of what's going on here, those will help you out. So what we needed was something to measure the hardness of the rubber. And there's one tool that's meant to do that, and it's called a durometer. And because I like old tools, I bought an old one. So this is a shore hardness tester, and it measures a shore hardness in the scale of A which is what we are in with this particular material. The most common shore hardness scales are A and D, and basically you're looking at uh, the A range goes from about the hardness of a rubber band up until what we're dealing with here, and the D range goes from that to up to the hardness of bone. So this comes with a little test block that is spring-loaded. It is calibrated to shore hardness A60 or 60A and as you can see it is right on the money. Now as far as the rest of the calibration for this I'm not really concerned about that. I'm just concerned about using this as a reference. So the way this thing works is very simple. You've got a spring-loaded needle right here. Depending on how far that depresses it will measure on the scale. Now what it'll also do is it'll sort of, it'll take a set, basically. You have to set it and then you'll see that it'll start to come down a little bit as the needle moves itself into the, into the part. Just for comparison's sake, uh, typical solid rubber gaskets, from what I have researched, run in the range of 10 to 70 on the shore A scale with uh, 40 being very soft and 90 being very hard. So it's not unusual for there to be a 90. It's just that's a, that's a, a little bit of a hard. The TPU is going to run uh, at room temperature. It's around 90, sometimes 85. You'll often see TPU referred to as TPU 95A, and that is it's considered its shore hardness, but I've noticed that after printing, it's normally in the 85 to 90 range. At least this brand is. Uh, other common rubbers that are used for gasket material, gasket material or O-rings, nitrile, neoprene, EPDM, uh, they're all in the 60A range. Uh, red SBR rubber, uh, that red sort of rubber you see sometimes, it's in the 75 to 80A range and Viton is usually in the 75A range. And also, just as a comparison, temperature-wise, except for Viton, this TPU material is within the same temperature ranges so far that uh, the other rubbers are. Viton can withstand quite a bit more up into the 200C range, but neoprene, nitrile, EPDM, they're all within the 100, 120 degree range. So I first started out with these pieces. And then I decided that that was way too juvenile of a joke. So I moved on to something that was a little bit more standardized and measurable. They'll all have the same size hole. They're all dimensionally the same. And, and they are thick enough that I don't have to worry about this small needle going through them and hitting the substrate. So something you may have noticed with the joke ones is that they are very different. So the difference between these is that one of them is heat treated and one of them isn't. And by heat treating what I mean is to bring it up to a certain temperature where it will, where its properties will change. And they won't just change at that temperature. Once you let it cool down, it will then keep some of those changes. And in this case, with plastic, it's slightly different with metal, but with, with 3D printed plastic, what you're essentially doing is uh, taking all these layer lines and melting them together. 
Now there's other things going on which I, I, I'm not really going to get into because I'm really not qualified enough to speak to. And that brings up another point. This is an amateur test uh, and while I am trying to use the proper terminology here I sometimes get it wrong and with the last video I again got it wrong. What I was measuring the last time was not the glass glass transition of this particular plastic. If it were a normal plastic like a PLA or a PETG that would have been a more accurate description. But what I was testing last time was actually the heat deflection at zero load. In other words, when this stuff starts to melt. With this sort of plastic, this sort of flexible plastic, this stuff, the glass transition of this stuff is actually like a negative Celsius. Uh, in other words, it's basically frozen hard. At any rate, we're changing, we're, what we're trying to do is change the properties and in this case we're trying to make it so that it resists heat a little bit more. A side positive of that though is as you see we have basically sealed this thing up. It has basically melted into a single a single blob and a really stupid juvenile joke. So there's not a lot of information about this online or I should say there's not a lot of free information about this online. There was a couple articles that I found which referred to primary experiments but didn't really link to those experiments. It just kind of said this is what should happen. The primary sources or experiments that I did find were all behind pay paywalls and um, I didn't really feel like paying $75 to, to see the results of their experiments. So after some trial and error, what I came up with was soaking this stuff for s several hours, maybe three to four, the longer actually the better, at around 150 degrees C will get this result. You may get it quicker, you may get it slower, it uh, just depends on time of the day, atmospheric pressure, you know, there's lots of factors that are going to be involved here. When I started doing the comparison tests, I will say that I tried to do them all on the same day so I could take away as much of the, the outside factors as possible. But, you know, th none of this was going to be a completely controlled experiment. You know, I just don't have the facilities to completely environmentally control every aspect of what's going on here. Around 150 degrees, soaked for several hours, got this result. And essentially, it makes the plastic smooth. What it also does is make it smaller. It doesn't really affect the height as much as it does the width. In fact, with this piece, it actually grew a little bit in height. So it's about 3.22 there, and my a control piece is about 2.82, so maybe a half a millimeter. You can see that it got smaller. But essentially what it looks like we're getting is about 2 to 5 percent of shrinkage. The height's more variable. The height in some instances stayed the same and in some instances we actually gained a little bit. I'm not so worried about the height, you know, if a gasket's a little bit thicker, a little bit thinner for the applications that I'm thinking about using it for, it's really not a big deal. Uh, but the shrinkage as far as width is a big deal and that includes the hole as well. We, again, we're losing about two to five percent. Now, the nice thing about printing plastic, you can correct that by increasing the scale when you create the file to print. So it's all well and good that we can do this to it, but does this really have any effect on its ability to withstand higher temperatures? It does, slightly. I'm not gonna bore you all by showing me doing this piece by piece, but essentially what I did over several hours and many pieces, I would do four pieces at a time. Two that were heat treated, two that weren't heat treated, get them up to a measurement temperature. What I used here was an old toaster oven and controlling the heat on a toaster oven is is something altogether different. So, but I use what I have. I think I actually got some pretty good results. So as they would get up to heat, I would let them soak there for, you know, maybe 15 minutes and then I would quickly take one out, quickly measure it, put it back, quickly take another one out, quickly measure it, measure it, put it back, and did that way too many times with way too many pieces just to try to get a good amount of data. I then just took the averages between the heat treated and not heat treated over the temperature scale and came up with this chart. Now as you can see in this chart we have the hardness scale on the left side, we have the temperature in Celsius at the bottom and the corresponding temperature in Fahrenheit at the top. The blue line represents our heat treated pieces 
and the, the orangish line represents our untreated. And as you can see, they're pretty close. The heat treated pieces do perform a little bit better at the slightly higher temperature and there's actually a little bit of overlap in a couple places. However, the untreated pieces do sharply fall off at 140. The heat treated pieces give a little bit better performance staying in the, the 50 hardness range. These results correspond very well with some other results online. Generally over the scale the heat treated pieces do perform a tiny bit better. They actually start a little bit harder but that only makes sense because essentially what you're doing here you're, you're melting the strands when you heat treat it to make this slightly more dense so it should be a little bit harder but as far as real world performance that's where it's going to come down to torque. So measuring its performance in the real world is much more difficult other than just throwing it on a machine which is I'm already doing and I'm in the process of doing. But a good test of that and I had a lot of comments about this would be to put the gasket under compression and then heat it and I did do that. I uh, used two pieces of aluminum and squeezed the gasket between it at a known torque setting and heated that up and see if it could hold that torque setting. I didn't use an extremely high torque setting because, I mean, let's be honest here, at some point this stuff is just going to start squeezing out. My purpose is not to prove that this stuff can be used as a head gasket that's torqued to 90 foot-pounds. My purpose is to be is to see if it will if it will hold its ceiling for things like uh, carburetor intakes or maybe even a valve cover. For those, you know, you're really talking in the 20 20 foot pound range. Now there's always exceptions to every rule, but you know, you don't torque a pressed steel valve cover down to 90 foot pounds. Now this test was a lot harder to test because you also have things happening like the, the expansion rate of aluminum, for instance. So this really needs a better test, but I'll tell you what I found anyway. At 20 foot pounds, the TPU would hold up to about 120 degrees Celsius. That's the outside limit though. Anything above that, it started to squeeze and you weren't going to hold any torque whatsoever. And I would not try to hold 20 foot-pounds at 120 degrees. I just don't think that that's, that's, that's reasonable for this material. Now, if we did something like, and this was also some in some other comments, if we did something like insert something to stiffen the material, for instance, a, a piece of metal, give the TPU a little bit more structure, that's a possibility. So now one other part of this, and this is kind of the last part of this, is what kind of temperatures are we really dealing with here? Um, for, in, in, my, in my test, I'm testing this on a mower. So what are the temperatures of a mower? So I took a bunch of temperatures. So I took some measurements all over this mower engine, which I'm running a long-term test on. This was a little bit surprising to me. I expected a little bit higher temperatures. So what we have here is where I put the gasket on, it's actually not that much above uh, the outside temperature. So it was about 26 degrees Celsius or about 79 degrees. Uh, Fahrenheit. From there, if we go down the intake where it meets the head of the engine, the cylinder head, increases quite significantly to 50 degrees Celsius, which is which is about 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, from there, I went to the muffler, and the muffler was 135 degrees Celsius, which is about 275 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's the highest temperature that I got. After letting the probe cool down, I went to the the valve cover was 77 degrees, but I also measured the actual cylinder head. The cylinder head was only about 33 degrees. What I think is going on here is the next measurement makes the difference and somebody else had mentioned this in the comments to measure the oil temperature and the oil temperature is 80 degrees Celsius which is 176 degrees Fahrenheit. Now what I think is going on is that that thin steel valve cover is actually in direct contact with the oil and it is the oil is heating it up what we measured which was about the same temperature as the oil whereas the head because it's a big much bigger block of aluminum it's able to dissipate that heat much much better and the last measurement i took was the overall block you know it's a large piece of metal so it can you know it can dissipate that heat over a large area and it only measured about 36 degrees fahrenheit or 36 degrees Celsius. If it's going to stay in the 80 degree range, now that might change a little bit on 
hotter days. But I'm willing to give it a shot now making a valve cover gasket. I'll just make sure that I keep a lookout for uh, smoke from uh, oil pouring out of it and hitting the muffler, which is right underneath of it, or uh, dripping plastic hitting the muffler. I'm less sure that this is going to work than I am that the that uh, the the gasket on the intake is going to work, but I kind of want to give it a shot because why not? I've come this far. Let's 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 try it too. We're just going to have a little fun with this and see how far we can push this stuff. So you know, I don't think this stuff is going to replace RTV or silicone or any type of other high performance, high temperature gasket material. That was never my point. My point was that can you use this to make uh, reusable gaskets fairly easily uh, for a, a thing like a lawnmower engine. And I think that there's a lot of places that it's possible. I'm already testing the testing it on the carburetor. I also plan to add to that test a valve cover gasket after seeing the temperatures that you know are not above what I'm finding is is viable for this material. I never wanted to suggest that this was going to be you know something that was going to replace uh, making your own gaskets out of paper or whatever. You know, everybody knows how to make a gasket out of paper. The Egyptians were cutting papyrus by, by slamming a round rock on, a, on an angled rock. Uh, you know, the old ball-peen hammer trick of, of making a gasket is as old as time. It's only a matter of whether you've heard of it or not. And yes, I know how to make a gasket. That's not the point. The point is, is this another tool in the toolbox? And personally, I think it is because making a, a removable gasket that you can, you know, take off and on and won't tear and you don't have to replace every time is more valuable to me than, um, than a paper gasket, which, you know, or, uh, uh, putting, or putting RTV sealant on that you have to actually, you know, physically use a knife to remove or a paper gasket that rips every time you use it. So I'm going to continue the test on the mower. Um, I don't have any plans to do any more testing as far as, you know, uh, scientific testing. If somebody comes up with an idea about doing maybe a more accurate torque test, I might consider doing that. But as it is right now, we're going to see where the mower goes. And uh, I really appreciate all your comments and all your views and all your likes on the last couple videos. Uh, really got a lot of great ideas of other uses that are, that are less intensive than what I'm doing here, but are great you know, they're, they're, they're great uses. I've had people talking to me about using them as, uh, as uh, speaker gaskets, as uh, gaskets that came in contact with brake fluid, they held up fine. This stuff is very resilient. And I, I think that, you know, in the future it has a use. And I think it already does have a use because lots of people told me that they were already using it. I hope you enjoy the videos. I will have another follow-up video on this. And uh, as well as I have an idea about uh, the next greatest thing for this stuff, which is O-rings. Until next time, thanks for watching. Bye.